Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then for planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. The four exit routes or paths that we most refer to on this podcast are sale to a third party, sale to insiders, sale or transfer to children or family, and sale to an ESOP. And today's topic really has impact on any one of these uh, exit options because to have a sellable or transferable business, which is foundational for success with any of these exit routes, it really helps if the owner has identified well in advance really and equip the successor to run the business with less and less help and involvement from the owner so that the business does not remain dependent on the owner. If you, the owner, remain central to the success of your business, then you could become trapped with few options for exit, if any, particularly options that are going to meet any of your financial goals and objectives or or other goals and objectives that you might have. So our topic today is ensuring tomorrow how to effectively choose and prepare your successor. That's right, Pat. And our guest is Michael Beck. And longtime listeners may remember Michael because he's actually, we think he's our only, he's one of two three-peat guests on our podcast. So it's great to have Michael. Those of you who aren't familiar with him, he's an executive strategist, He's an author. He's the president of Eliciting Excellence, a firm specializing in the assessment, development, and recruiting of successors. He and his team work with leaders who will be taking over the running of a company in order to improve interpersonal skills, strategic thinking, and judgment. Michael doesn't really have much in the way of credentials, but he does have an MBA from Wharton. I guess he couldn't get into the University of Maryland. Uh, Degree in engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. He's worked both domestically and internationally with a wide range of clients from diverse industries. A listening Excellence offers assessments and executive coaching, all designed to help successors succeed and owners get paid. Two things that we're very interested here on the Exit Readiness podcast. So, Michael, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you. Hey, th- thanks, uh, Patton and Walter. I, I, uh, Always love being here as a guest and uh, love sharing insights. Yeah, well, you're in a you're in a small and elite group, uh, Michael. As WD Thank you. pointed out, I think you're one of only two three Peters. Yeah. So, so Michael, as you, you should add that to your, I'm gonna add that to my your, bio, your, your bio and your credentials. Yeah. You can I'd probably that. put that. I'd probably put that before the MBA in finance from Wharton. <laughs> well, it's more. It's more recent. That makes it more relevant, right? <laughs> okay, good. We can go with that. Yeah. All right. So, Michael, let's start right off. You know, based on your experience working with businesses throughout the country and the research you've done, can you just right off the top just share some insights with our listeners that you have on the implications for business owners when it comes to uh, successors? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, like you mentioned, I, I, I do work and network around the country, talk to a lot of different folks. And so um, to me, uh, here are the trends that I've seen. Um, I've written before about how um, there's going to be a, a significant surplus of sellers over buyers as the baby boom wave begins. And uh, in, in chatting with advisors around the country, it seems like an awful lot of boomer owners are retiring more in their mid seventies than they are in their mid sixties. And uh, at at first I didn't understand why that was happening. And then after thinking and researching a little bit back, back, let's say in the 1970s, life expectancy was about 72 and people were retiring at around 65. Well, now life expectancy is about 10 years later in their eighties and consequently more and more people are retiring in their mid seventies, 10 years after that. So it's interesting to note that this year, 
baby, the leading edge of the baby boomers turns 75. And so I believe this, this wave of boomer retirements has, has begun. It's already begun. And um, some people are, are seeing some um, drops in multiples. So even if you're looking to sell to an outsider, there are some interesting implications because as the surplus grows, uh, buyers are more selective and, and you know, the, the, the good businesses aren't as rare. And so I think multiples will be dropping. I think it's critical to have your business as attractive as possible going into it. I think that, um, I, I think that there's a secondary complication. And that is if you're planning on having a successor, if you don't start now ensuring that they're well-prepared and then you get caught flat-footed, in other words, they're not prepared when time comes, you're going to be stuck because there's going to be a glut of businesses on the market and um, you won't have many op options after that. Yes. <clears throat> so then, Michael, as you know, many of the owners that we work with are indeed baby boomers and they have these situations that you're referring to there. And um, they are thinking of selling to an insider, a key employee maybe who has helped them build the business right. uh, and, and or a child. Uh, um, like we had a situation a couple of years ago where that was the case, uh, a key employee insider and the son and the business has been successfully transferred uh, to those two people. Talk to us, share with the listeners your thoughts about how to choose a successor in one of those situations. So that's actually a good question. And, and I think it's relevant, um, maybe more relevant than even you've suggested. Uh, I've got a client right now where uh, I got brought in, the, the, the owner in his 60s, late 60s, um, had a brother in the business and also some other key employees and couldn't decide whether to, you know, tap the brother as the successor, uh, share responsibilities and have multiple successors with key employees. So we went in and we uh, did uh, an objective assessment. And I think that's a critical step. Uh, for several reasons. One, it, it's hard to be objective when you're in the middle of it. Num and number two, if you've got to decide on, on one over another, the more objective you can be about that, the easier that not only the decision, but people accepting that decision becomes. Anyway, let me, let me continue with this story with this, this guy. We did five assessments, five leaders were being considered. And none of them actually stood out as being a, a good candidate to be the successor. But he wanted to um, be loyal to his family. He was actually second gen. And, um, and so he decided to tap his brother, who was in his mid 50s, tap his brother to ultimately take over the running of the company, asked me to coach him, which I did. And after about three months, I, I called a, a meeting with the owner, private meeting. And I said, look, you, you cannot do this. He's not the right person for this. And, um, and the owner said, yeah, I kind of thought you were going to say that. And so uh, instead of just throwing up his hands and exploding, um, we came up with a different strategy and, and, the impetus for him to retire was that he was just so tired of the day to day and he, he, he didn't like doing some of the work, certain tasks. And so actually I've begun coaching the owner and continue to coach the owner on how to, how to get more and more off his plate, how to groom the others, the other leaders to take on more and more responsibility. And so that down the road, maybe a year or two years from now, one of them will have blossomed and become ready to take over or they'll find an outside buyer or, or he'll just continue to run it, but have less and less involvement in the day to day. Yeah. So one of the things that we will communicate to, to clients of ours who, who, who have this exit round in mind and have a particular successor in mind mm. is that, Look, they may be fantastic key employees, 
but that doesn't mean they're going to be a great owner or that they're built to be an owner. And there's a difference between the two. Yep, and absolutely. I'm curious, in that situation that you just you you just uh, mentioned to us, those five success uh, candidates, are they all key employees and in, in really making an impact as a key employee? And it just no. turns out that they're, uh, is that right? Okay. No, they, they weren't. Um, he actually had no real key employees. He had long-term employees, but but he had been running the show. You know, you, we we all hear about owners who uh, don't relinquish responsibility and delegate decision making and things. And so they're central to the running of the business, and they can't really step away because they haven't groomed anybody. And so um, that was the case in this as well. Plus, it, it was a fairly small company. Uh, I forget they had, I don't know, they had like 30, 40 employees. And, um, and he, he just hadn't really given it the forethought that it needed. But to, uh, I'll add one more story to, to, to reiterate your point, because you're spot on, Pat. Um, a number of years ago, I, I got brought in to help an owner uh, clarify really what is this successor need? What kind of competencies? And so we spent some time, some, a number of sessions talking about what the needs of the company were and what his responsibilities were and so on and so forth. And his intention was to give it to a long-term employee, the key employee. And just in passing, well, not in passing, I asked him because it occurred to me we hadn't discussed it. I said, by the way, how does the business get business? Who's the rainmaker? He goes, well, I am. And I said, wait a minute, you want to get, hand your company over to your office manager. How are you going to get business? He said, well, I'll train her. It's like, no, that's a personality issue. You, you don't train uh, uh, an administrator to be a salesperson. So he wasn't happy, but it's the truth, nevertheless. So we, they have blind spots. We all do. Hey, Michael, following up on that, let me ask you a question. I don't even, not even sure this is really easily answerable, but. Are there certain positions in a company that lend themselves to the person in that position has what has the ability to become a, an owner easier? He's a better candidate for succession. Or I guess another way to put it is, are there certain personality traits that almost disqualify a person because you can't, you can't overcome them? And are there certain personality traits that are, that are great as a baseline for then training, training someone to become a successor? No. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> <my bad. laughs> Let me I'll elaborate on that. Um, I, no, I don't believe that there is one role or position that tends to be a better successor than another. It's really comes down to whether a person is business savvy, whether they're, they're open to learning, uh, uh, more about the business than their, their own little silo, right? And so uh, it depends on the size of the business and the complexity of the business. You know, what uh, we know, we all know many owners who are not salespeople. They don't drive the company. And yet on a small business, it's almost always the owner. So it kind of depends on the nature of the company, whether they need to have more of an outgoing personality or not. Um, uh, ostensibly, if they've been with the company for a while, they're in alignment with the culture of the company and their personality fits that company. So there wouldn't be a personality clash. Now, when we recruit, we recruit successors for, for companies that don't have a successor. Because uh, sometimes people want someone to be a successor, but people, those folks aren't interested. Um, the, the, the key driver, because it's easy to find technical knowledge, key driver in the candidates we find is their cultural fit and personality, because that's what's going to make the difference in the long term. Does that answer it? That makes Sorry. sense. That's that's a great yeah. answer. Thank you. So, following up on what you just said, so let's say you have a we have a business, and the owner says to us, you know, I just don't feel like, you know, I've got some key employees, kind of like what you said. I've got some key employees, but I just don't think any of them is really successor material. Is your approach then to first go in, meet with them to kind of validate his opinion? And then I'd never really thought of this. And then you active, then you actively go outside the company to recruit 
a potential successor? Uh, not exactly. I mean, I, my take on it is if an owner who's been day to day with their team feels that none of them are really uh, have the right makeup, then they probably don't have the right makeup. I don't, I don't second guess the owner. So to the second point, um, years ago, I realized that there, there is and is going to continue to be a need to find successors for owners who either want to, want to keep it internal but don't have, um, don't have a successor, or they were hoping to sell and they can't sell, and now their alternative, the best alternative is to find a successor. So, I mean, we have a whole separate uh, successor recruiting business just for that. That's, a, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, th I think that makes sense too. Um, so what advice would you give to the fortunate business owner who does have a successor candidate? How should they go about developing that candidate? Uh, it, it's a good question, and it seems like it should be pretty straightforward, I think, but it generally is not pretty straightforward. What I've found is that um, owners are really good at making sure that successor knows all the aspects of the business. And I call that the mechanics of the business. I, I, I've identified it as four stages. So there's a, contr a contributor stage where they're doing the work, you know, they, they, they're actually in the trenches, this successor. And then there's the manager stage where they oversee work. And they make sure that everyone's getting the work done and that, and that the work is being done on time. And, and I consider both of those uh, the mechanics of the business. The, the, the other two stages, the things that it doesn't address are things like leadership, interpersonal skills, um, decision-making, uh, vision, strategic thinking. And a lot of times owners don't help their successor get up to that next level. So the consequence is you get somebody in there who can absolutely run that business. They just can't take it anywhere. They just keep, you know, it keeps treading water. So, so either they, they, they'll make a bad decision or, I mean, a perfect example is where the owner doesn't relinquish control of the company until the, the, the transition happens. And then the successor makes changes just because they can, not for a good reason. It's just finally they have control. And so you end up with bad decisions. So um, there's that aspect of it. There, there's another practical aspect. I, I think it's almost impossible for an owner to properly develop their successor. And there are several reasons why. One is there's always the interpersonal dynamic, right? Either if it's a family member, there's the family dynamics involved, long-term employee. Uh, the, I mean, one of the dynamics is that they, the successor knows the person they're talking to it's going to ultimately decide whether to make them the successor. So they don't want to upset them. They, you know, they, they become yes men or women. Uh, so you have that interpersonal dynamic issue going on. Another one is that, like, like we mentioned a minute ago, we all have blind spots and ne neither the successor nor the owner can see what they're missing. So it helps to bring it an outside set of eyes. Uh, a third point is that Everybody around the successor has an agenda. So there's a lack of objectivity, e e whether it's the owner or their peers or their spouse or their team. People either want things to stay the same or they want things to change. And so it's hard for them to get an objective perspective and help them think objectively. So there's that issue. And then, I mean, a couple other practical issues. It takes time. It's called leadership development or successor development rather than training because you can't read a book and just magically change. And then, and owners don't have that time. And then frankly, there's a skill set. I mean, the skills that got the owner where they are, aren't the same skills needed to develop leadership and strategic thinking. I mean, I've been doing it 20 years. And so I'm far better than I was 20 years ago. It just comes from practice and refinement. Yeah, so Michael, you mentioned four phases of development. Um, yes. Or, uh, and I got the first two contributors. Oh, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, elaborate on the other two. I, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. So I, I call it a contributor role, then a manager role. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the other two are leadership or executive, which is a key employee role. And then finally, the ownership role, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and when you, because if you think about it, really up until they take over, a successor has only ever been an employee. They've never been an owner. And owners think differently than employees. Mm -hmm. They think differently about finances, about the future, about competition, about the market. And so, um, you, you know, uh, owners have, a, have the, the big, th not only the 30,000 foot view, but they, they take into consideration all aspects of a business where, where certainly at the lower levels, they're very, very, very focused on their silo. So the leadership executive and owner stages are, pr are pretty critical to get developed to make it a really successful successor. Mm -hmm. And Michael, do you have, have you written anything on that on 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 just that piece, those four phases, and the, have I written anything? Yeah, on 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 what we were just yeah. talking about. Yeah, I, yeah. There's an article on on uh, the blog on the website about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Michael, well, do you, do you yes, envision a period of time where you have the successor and the owner together? So I guess I always envision it: the owner's out the door, the successor's in charge. But it kind of sounded like you alluded to a period of time where maybe the owner's still there, but he's delegated the authority to the successor. Or did I did I mis misinterpret that? Um, yes, and sort of. <laughs> so let, let me. I, I understand where, where you're coming from, Walter. And the thing is that um, I gave you an example where the owner was ready to pull the trigger and hadn't really done his work with with his successor. And um, in addition, it, it might sound like, well, based on what I just said, that the owner can teach the successor the mechanics of the business. After that, they have no role. And that's not true. So the two tie together, what you've brought up, Walter, and, and, and uh, the, the other uh, aspects of development that I brought up actually uh, dovetail because there are certain things only an owner can do. Only an owner can allow their successor to make decisions and help them refine their decision-making process, correct mistakes in their thinking. And so they've got to do that to properly prepare their successor. In, in addition, um, only the owner can share past mistakes and the lessons learned because they're not always, it's not intuitively obvious to other people. So only the owner can do that. It's, and and, you know, to the example, Walter, that you, you pointed out that I gave, uh, that owner had not done any of that with those folks. And then the third thing that only an owner can do is to uh, point out the importance and reinforce the culture of the company. Because there's a saying in our, in our business that culture eats strategy for lunch, meaning that, that uh, a strong culture will always produce far better results than a weak culture, even with a good strategy. And so uh, you don't want the successor to be unappreciative of that and make changes to a, a good culture. Mm -hmm. I hope that yeah, so as question. we wrap up here, um, Michael, it, this time's just flown by. Two, two things. First off, at the outset, you know, I mentioned the four exit routes that we m most often reference on this podcast yeah. because they're the ones that are most uh, put in place by our, uh, our market, our owners, really. And that would be sale to a third party, sale to insiders, like what we've been talking about, sale to kids, sale to ESOP. And yeah. I mentioned that identifying a successor or successors and having them trained up really is essential for any of those in any of those exit routes. Would you agree with that point? And if so no, no doubt about it. In fact, it just because you brought it up, I'll bring this up. I'll mention this. We also developed a quality of leadership report, which is comparable to quality of earnings. So when it comes to third party sales, it's an it's a nice way for the seller to objectively establish the strength of the leadership team. And it elevates the value of the company. The strong team. All right, very good. And then lastly, is this fair to say that once an owner helps that successor learn the mechanics, as you put it, of a business, um, there's not much more they can do? Well, like, like I said, it, it, it might sound like that, but 
In fact, those three areas that I just uh, mentioned with, with uh, when I was chatting with Walter about the owner um, needs to allow the successor to make decisions. Uh, when, when I'm brought in, I, I, can't, I, have that, I don't have that ability. I can help them figure out what decision to make, but it's only after the owner goes, okay, I want you to think about this and tell me what you would do. And then the second thing that an owner, and these are all critical, and without these, nothing will work, by the way. Uh, sharing past mistakes is something only the owner can do. And then the third thing is the, the um, clarity and reinforcement of the culture and its importance. And I mean, I can talk in gen general terms, but the owner who established this culture is the one to really drive it home. So it's a, a pretty critical role after the, even after the mechanics are taught. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Michael, thanks again for joining us. As with the previous two times you were here, this was great. I'm sure the listeners enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, two things. Is there anything you'd like to promote today? And how can our listeners uh, contact you? Thank you. Um, you know, I there are, um, well, cl clearly the services we provide are successor assessment, development, and recruiting and that quality of leadership report. Um, uh, there are a few, f there's one other thing that they can find on our website. Uh, I have a, a, a set of successor readiness questions. It's a free download and they can find the link uh, at the website. And it's not meant to be a, an assessment, but I think it, hopefully it will be thought provoking and, and have an owner give thought to whether they've done a good job or whether they've been holding the successor back unintentionally, typically. And, and to reach me, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you two websites and my email address. So our main website is el elicitingexcellence.com, E-L-I-C-I-T-I-N-G, excellence.com. And that's where they can find that download. And also our, our successor recruiting site, which is successor-recruiting.com. And they're welcome to contact me directly. My email is mbeck at elicitingexcellence.com. Fantastic. Thanks again, Michael. Really, hey, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Great. Walter. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Enjoy Michael. It, always as always. a pleasure. What's that? It's always a pleasure. Same here. And listeners, if you need help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Pat at 301-859-0860. You can reach me at 301-951-9090. You can also access resources at exitreadiness.com, grfcpa.com, and nslp.com. Thank you for listening. And until next time, as always, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off. Thank you.